I'm Bill Fisher uh, with Growth Matters. I am the uh, industry chair for the Human Capital SIG. Uh, and um, I was going to say my partner in crime, uh, uh, Mika Cross, uh, the government chair for the SIG, is uh, dialing in this morning. And uh, I would just like to welcome everyone uh, to uh, our meeting today. Uh, uh, and again, uh, just to kind of introduce uh, the remaining members of the leadership team, and then we'll, we'll kind of jump right into the meeting. Uh, we also have Lisa Taylor from Deloitte, uh, the vice chair or the vice industry chair for the SIG. Uh, Debbie Brown, uh, the program chair, who will um, give us an update in a few minutes uh, about upcoming um, current and upcoming programs for the SIG, where uh, great opportunities for both industry and government to get involved. Uh, Robert Clark, um, our communications chair, uh, Gary Powell, um, our knowledge chair, and then uh, Robert Wright, uh, our program support specialist uh, with IAC is here today and has kindly offered to uh, videotape the, uh, today's session, uh, especially for those who uh, aren't able to uh, participate uh, in the meeting uh, today. Uh, so um, again, we have a wonderful event today. Uh, entitled uh, Creative STEM Recruiting in Federal Agencies. Uh, and um, so I promise to get to our star attractions here uh, very shortly. Um, but before I do so, um, uh, again, just to remind everyone about the mission of ACT IAC. Um, the mission of ACT IAC is to bring together uh, government and industry uh, in a partnership to. Um, to engage in at least what I like to call fierce conversations on topics that matter, right? So we're all here today because we're passionate about uh, human capital and learning. And so really this is an open forum and an opportunity to mutually exchange um, ideas on uh, making government better, right? And, and I think that there certainly is a shared interest in uh, building pipelines of talent and specifically uh, around um, uh, talent focused on science, technology, engineering, and math, which um, uh, there is a, a big challenge today in, in terms of uh, continuing to build those pipelines. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Deb, and, and Deb's just going to talk about current programs and kind of what we have in our pipeline in terms of up, upcoming programs. So Deb, I'll turn Executive Director of the STEM Education Coalition. And uh, our coalition is an alliance of a little more than 500 business, education, and professional organizations whose goal is to promote STEM education as a national policy priority. And I thought sort of to set the stage in kind of one, one, uh, one, one statement about sort of how, how we look at the STEM education issue and what the challenge is. Um, one of my favorite polls is from 2011 done by Harris and it asked parents whether they thought STEM education should be a priority in the school system, and about 93% said yes. But they asked them, do you think it's a priority in your school system, and only 49% said yes. And I think therein lies the challenge of what we deal with as a coalition trying to push this as an issue. Everybody feels like it should be a priority, but we're all struggling to make it a priority because education systems change slowly, and the economy is changing much more quickly. So, the purpose of today's event is to talk about how this lays across HR issues within the federal government and that are facing challenges hiring their own STEM workforces and working with companies and other private sector interests on projects in this particular space. So let me begin by uh, introducing our other four panelists, and I'll start down there at the end with Ventress Gibson, who, uh, who I think has the most interesting acronym in her title. I, I am not a big user of acronyms in my world other than STEM, which we do not compromise on. Um, but uh, she is a Chico, and she's the Chico, from what I understand, for, for the entire um, health and Department of Health and Human Services. Of course, Chief Human Capital Officer and Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary in the uh, Office of Human Resources at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, to her left, is Bernadette Williamson Taylor, who's lead regulatory health education specialist in the office of the chief scientist at the Food and Drug Administration, and has also worked for the Center for Biologic Cell Evaluation and Research and the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Uh, to her left is Dr. Susan Singer, who's the division director for the Division of Undergraduate Education at the National Science Foundation's Education and Human Resources Directorate, 
which the EHR director has so called invests a little under one billion dollars a year in research into all forms of science and technology education writ large. It's really the largest source of, uh, of evaluation and research within the STEM fields. And then to my right is Chris Dobbins, who's chief of the office of HR strategies at the National Security Agency. And I'm sure can, uh, can, can tell us a few interesting stories and perhaps not tell us many, many more about his work at the National Security Agency. So, with that, I think I'll start with you, Chris, and we're going to go through each panelist for perhaps five or ten minutes and talk about how their agency is seeing STEM education as a challenge, particularly with a focus on HR, and then we'll have some questions and back and forth. So, Chris? Very good. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Chris Dobbins, again from the National Security Agency. Um, so just a little quick background in terms of uh, uh, my office's portfolio. So I'm principally responsible for more strategic projects at the National Security Agency having to do with human capital management. Uh, that includes areas of uh, compensation, incentive programs, um, recognition, reward, uh, also all of our occupational structure, uh, all the HR policy associated with the National Security Agency in the area of human capital management, uh, and again, big project management in terms of kind of big key initiatives that we do. Um, so when I was asked to uh, appear here uh, today, I. I tried to do a little bit of research since uh, actually education and recruiting is not kind of one of my key areas. So as typically the case, I got on and started Googling a bunch of stuff. Um, but as is typically with the case when I start Googling things, I get distracted easily. So um, I, I saw an article on recruitment and immediately started going to that and realized it was not actually about STEM. Uh, but if you'll bear with me, I'll read a little teeny bit about it because I think it's relevant. So. Uh, the article was actually from the Washington Post. So it talks about the recruitment of a student athlete named Dewan Ellis uh, that was being recruited by St. John's High School, which is uh, a high school apparently located here in the district somewhere. Uh, but the article goes on to say, uh, the motivation for St. John's was clear. The school would be acquiring a wonderkind athlete, a six foot, 150 pound gazelle, who could throw the ball 50 yards on a line. A player who many area high school coached coaches call a program changer. So the motivation for Ellis was equally transparent. He would get to play on a high profile high school team and experience that four years down the road could lead to a lucrative high, a college football scholarship and possibly beyond. Ellis is the face of the new era in high school football, the aggressive recruitment of middle school players. So. So I read the article, and of course, I, I thought that was crazy that we were that we were recruiting uh, for high school out of the elementary school. So I zipped down to my next Google article, which was a little bit more on point. And, and again, I'll read from that one a little bit. So this one's from the uh, US News and World Report. So uh, the article's on recruiting the next generation of STEM employees. So it goes on to say, how can companies find the next generation of engineers, computer scientists, team leaders, that will be the innovative and creative that will be innovative and create new products by fostering internship programs creating community partnerships collaborating with universities and other initiatives that reach the youngest lego fans all the way up to phd students companies should introduce programs to reach students at the elementary middle and high school levels experts say who knew so, um, so the point of, the point I'm making here again was, again, so you see that there's a there's a push on all all levels, in fact, to push the recruitment of talent down even lower than what we would have ever imagined even five or ten years ago. So, um, my belief is that this is actually one of the areas where NSA is very good, in fact. Um, so we do a lot of investment, in fact, in uh, more student level uh, engagement and recruiting. Um, we're known actually to go out and do quite a bit of recruiting at the, the high school level. I've had a couple of high school students that have worked in my office, uh, but the programs themselves are actually quite large, measured in the hundreds of students, so they don't exist only at the high school level. Uh, clearly we have other programs that are also in place uh, in terms of at the college and university level. Um, we do a number of things that are more ongoing throughout the year, and then we have programs that um, where again we attempt to try to hook the students early uh, and that would be the good hooking actually so um, and so we look to try to bring in people principally in the kind of the, the stem areas 
that were referenced, again, math, engineering, computer science, also in the intelligence area. Um, so we make those opportunities available to that cadre of individuals, principally on a couple of things. One, um, because again, we like to get the hook into the students early, um, because it provides us the opportunity to uh, really communicate what that government value proposition is by being employed in government. It's, a, it's an opportunity that we get that we don't get typically with most of our other college graduates because they don't know that much about what employment in the government is about. Um, so it, again, it gives us an opportunity to get them early um, and then it allows them to get in and work inside the National Security Agency to get a sense of what our mission's all about uh, and then they get enthusiastic about that and typically our um, our re-engagement and our hire with uh, student, employ student employees uh, after the fact uh, is actually fairly substantial. Um, typically we're able to retain our students as permanent employees uh, in the 90% level. Uh, in some occasions, again, we've had high school students, again, when they graduated exclusive of the ones that were opting to go to uh, other colleges, uh, you know, out of the local area, Sometimes we've been able to accomplish at you know even the hundred percent level. So again, I think those are some of the things that uh, again go to the topic of our uh, discussion today about recruiting for the STEM talent. Um, and I think that probably underscores maybe some of the key things where NSA is actually doing pretty well. So hold on a second. So um, so can I ask everybody on the phone lines just to mute your phones for getting a, a little bit of additional contribution from at least one of you? <laughs> so so now we'll turn to Dr. Susan Singer. Well, thank you. And I just to speak to your 90 to 100 percent success rate, my nephew is 18 months into a career with you as a result of an internship. So. Um, Sorry, that we can turn the volume. Just talk. Is that okay? Is there any way we can mute the phone? Mute the phone ourselves. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it's well, wait, then they can't hear us. They can't yeah. hear us. All right, hold on a second. Hello, this is uh, James Brown, the moderator here in the room. We're going to ask again for everybody to mute their phones because we have a large number of people on the conference call line. We're going to have to be a little bit more disciplined. So thank you very much for muting your phone. Yeah, anyway, we're just going to get the operator because sometimes they do identify the well. Yeah, well, I'll just jump in and, and talk <laughs> over <laughs> them and try not to get too distracted by that that interesting feedback. Um, so the the National Science Foundation has um, a unique mission across the the federal agencies in its dual mission to bring together cutting edge education, education research, and frontier science and. So we're trying to leverage that in our efforts. I, I want to kind of step way back and then kind of focus in on some specific programs and then focus in on different ways we've been partnering with industry. So my stepping way back, there's a handout um, that I brought about um, the federal five-year STEM strategic plan. So it's a STEM education plan and it cuts across all areas of STEM education from engagement, right, in formal science, P12, undergraduate, graduate education, a real strong focus on broadening participation. And the overall intent of this cross-agency effort is to better leverage and increase the impact that we're collectively having to improve STEM education. It's a really exciting effort. Um, it's been underway for a number of years. The actual report came out in uh, May of 2013, and I've had the uh, pleasure of convening the undergrad group. And so this has a lot of information we need to go into um, in depth today, but it gives you a sense of the key focus areas um, in the broader setting and specifically within the undergrad group. And then within the National Science Foundation, we are uh, very much see high quality STEM education and workforce development as being all the piece, not things that are you know, on opposite ends of the continuum. There's a nice investment we had in a study that came out from the National Academies called Education for Life and work that does a, a very helpful job of 
breaking down not just the need for cognitive skills in terms of being uh, workforce ready, but all the intrapersonal, interpersonal skills that we're collectively starting to pay more attention to in terms of success in the workplace. So kind of a broad level there, and then that is a segue into looking at our portfolio in education and human resources, which again goes from informal to informal, from pre-K, through graduate school and degree actually in the informal ed. We have three key focus areas that all of our investments um, cut across. Workforce development, improving learning and learning environments, and um, also broadening participation, and that's an asset-based versus a deficit-based model that um, we all work better together and more creatively solve problems and broadly participation is truly encompassing of, of all groups. Um, I would like to focus on a range of different examples where we have partnered with industry in terms of improving um, workforce related outcomes with STEM related fields. And I would underscore that by noting that there's a, you know, the term STEM savvy we hear more and more. I think it's really important to recognize that there are many jobs that are not identified by um, BLS as being a STEM job but really require STEM skills to be successful. So when we talk about STEM education, truly we're talking about everybody, future citizens, students that are STEM ready, and students that we want to be um, STEM savvy. So the middle skills workforce is an area that's received a lot of attention and rightful attention recently, a great opportunity for individuals to go and have good, solid paying jobs, good career trajectories, and many of those are in areas of advanced technologies. So whether it's biotech, advanced manufacturing, photonics, um, alternative energy, terrific jobs out there. We've had a program in place for 21 years called the Advanced Technological Education Program. We invest about $65 million a year in ATE, and it is a program that's centered in the community colleges, but includes seventh graders through college graduates, four-year college graduates. And what's unique about this program amongst our programs is from the get-go, the investigators have to have a very robust partnership with industry. So something like the Amtech Center, which is an um, automotive uh, manufacturing technical training center started in Kentucky back in 2006. Toyota was setting up a plant and didn't have the skilled technicians that needed partnered with a community college. And this has now grown into a national center, 32 community colleges, 12 states, thousands of community college students getting prepared to go into jobs every year. And it's not just Toyota now, it's BMW, it's Ford, it's Chrysler, it's General Motors, it's, it's a whole supply chain that leads into automotive manufacturing as well. These centers are found in all 50 states, in the territories, there's um, project-based ones, regional centers, national centers, and recently we created a meta center of five centers to provide support to the Department of Labor's um, TACT um, it, uh, orgies that, where there's a really terrific investment in building those skills for going on there. So that is done at the level of an individual grant. Um, we also have had an interesting partnership recently with Intel and General Electric where their funds actually came in to pair with our funds to run a special competition in our STEM talent expansion program aimed at increasing the number of computer scientists and engineers that are graduating. And I'll give you two examples that came out of that that are really interesting experiments. We're learning a lot from these experiments. One is um, at um, 
Cal State Monterey Bay and Hartnell College, which is a community college. And they partnered and said, wow, it would be really terrific if low income students could get a high quality computer science education and get out and be in the workplace in a shorter amount of time. Because even with financial aid, if you're a low income student with a lot of other obligations and commitments, it's tough to stay in school. So they devised a program between them that's a three-year computer science degree, a year and a half at Hartnell, a year and a half at Cal State Monterey Bay. And they're two years into it, and it looks very promising in terms of the retention. They've employed a range of strategies and supports of co-curricular. Go a little further north on the West Coast, complementary and very different model. Washington State and the University of Washington have partnered and they have, after the sports metaphor, um, the, it, they're using a red shirt um, model. So again, low income students that come in often come from high schools where they've not had access to the same level and quality of STEM training and say, and this is an engineering program. I started out life as an engineer and I can just really resonate with this, right? You go in to sit down in calculus and everybody around you, well, they already took calculus and now ah, they got a four or five on the advanced placement exam. But you know, they're gonna take it again just to make sure they get off to a good start with their GPA and students that have not had that are sitting there going, oh my goodness, right? It's not a level playing field. So um, this particular um, effort that's underway creates a five-year program. And in the first year, it's not you know, a remedial or a developmental math program in the way some of our other investments are that we can talk about in the discussion later. Um, but getting these students to understand how to access resources, right? Many first generation students have no idea how to, or that there's even help available. So learning to be successful in college and then jumping in ready to go and continuing on to be successful. So those are um, two areas where we've had partnerships. We've got a partnership with the Welcome Trust, um, which is a private foundation to push on STEM learning in informal settings. We have a scholarship program that's funded with H-1B visa money, um, the S-STEM, um, Scholarships for STEM program, where there's regional alignment with workforce so that the students that are going to these schools who are most likely to work in that area are developing, school, uh, developing skills aligned with the workforce needs in their area. So there's a lot of other examples. I want to give my colleagues time to talk, so I'm gonna pass the baton. Thank you. Um, this is Bernadette Lansing Taylor, and I'm at the Food and Drug Administration. Specifically, I'm in the Office of Scientific Professional Development, and our office is newly established. We're about three years old. And the purpose of our office is pretty much self-explanatory, scientific professional development. Um, we've noticed in areas of science and, bio and biotechnology that um, trying to recruit your more seasoned level scientists, um, is, there's competition because in biotechnology you could be an in industry making lots of money and then why would you want to come to the government? So some of the things we have established are special hiring authorities, which Title 38 is among the agencies excuse me, across the government. And then there's um, Title 42, which is specific to the Public Health Service Act, under which we are. And that specifically helps us to hire scientists. Particularly, my office focuses on training, recruiting, and awards. So our office is maintained of two different arms, one with recruitment, and I'll get into some of those programs. And then the other one specific for professional development and training in sciences. We have established lots of programs, especially to enhance the skills of scientists in the agency. Um, regarding the fellowship program we have for recruiting, we have the Commissioner's Fellowship Program, which is a two-year training program designed to attract graduate students to come into regulatory science who we may not be interested in or not particularly unaware of what regulatory science is. So um, for that particular program, 
we've had a 75% retention rate for all of our graduates who've decided to stay and come on and advance their careers. Um, particularly for STEM, our office, we make sure that we, because of the nature of FDA and its public health mission, and actually the nature of the products that we regulate, which is really has an impact on, on biotechnology, or biotechnology has an impact on the regulations and the products, we ensure that the skills that, we enhance the skills of our scientists, so, and our clinicians. So some of that would be some of the programs we have, continuing education to make sure that our, our clinicians are current with their license, different types of lecture programs, different types of series, different types of education programs to really enhance those skill sets. Um, some of the other things we do as far as education is we also have academic visits where different types of schools um, can come to the agency, interact with scientists, learn on how they actually progressed and got into the FDA and give them some pointers. Um, it's very interesting to hear the response of the students when they come into the agency and have the opportunity to speak with their scientists because it's, it's amazing of one, how much they're unaware of what we do as an agency and they're unaware of, okay, maybe I should go into biology or maybe I should study math or I didn't realize I could be an engineer and work at the Food and Drug Administration. So it's, we really try to make that connection early on as well. One of the new programs which is being established in my office is the STEM Outreach Program, where we are focusing on K through 12 education. And myself, I was a former STEM teacher, so this is near and dear to my heart. And what we're, we've decided to do is spread the knowledge, spread the knowledge of the agency, um, reach younger kids, get them excited about innovation and regulatory science and some of the areas that we, we're starting off locally since this is a new program within the local school systems with, um, that have diverse backgrounds. And then we plan on launching off um, more nationally as time progresses. Um, with the Commissioner's Fellowship Program, we've noticed that there is a, you have you have biologists, you have physicians, you have engineers, you have a different conglomerate of STEM-related careers who come through. Um, within our particular graduates, we do see diversity in fields as well. So it's not just necessarily STEM, but we try to make sure that we recruit those who are of different ethnicities and different backgrounds, as well as those um, who are underrepresented in STEM education. So that's really the overview of what we do in STEM. Good morning, this is Ventress Gibson, I'm the Associate DAS for HR at HHS, and I wanted to thank Bernadette and the other panel members. Uh, I, I have a unique passion for this subject matter because I am aviation, I have an aviation background. In the military, I was near traffic controller and coming out, uh, worked a lot with veterans and ultimately retired after 35 years with FAA. But during that time, uh, we had a huge aviation focus while with FAA and actually worked to, I worked on the President's Commission for the Future of the Aviation Workforce where we looked very heavily at STEM and invested significantly in engineering and other STEM occupations related to aviation. Uh, one of the things that we did, which is uh, something that I believe the federal government could take a look at going forward, is in order to reach out to those, we created programs where we partnered with colleges and universities under the title of Collegiate Training Initiative. And under the Collegiate Training Initiative, we were able to actually provide instructors to lead aviation-focused courses in air traffic control so that when these students completed their uh, associate or baccalaureate level uh, attainment of aviation management, there was an air traffic control position waiting for them. That's huge, and I believe that's something we could look forward to uh, in the future. Because air traffic controllers had an entry of age 18 and by age 30, 
we also became experts at recruiting the next generation. Uh, having 16,000, our administrators said, we need to somehow engage the next generation of workers. Thus, I became responsible for developing and, and actually training uh, generational experts, ultimately to become a generational expert. So we have worked uh, in that capacity in teaching the generations, watching them come in, and knowing what millennials and Gen Xers expect. That being said, I retired after a number of years, and the government has recruited me back through HHS. And I'm now responsible for oversight of STEM within the department. One of the things that we are now creating within the corporate office of the Chief Human Capital Officer is a STEM-focused organization that our motto will be each one, reach one, teach one. And in doing so, we actually are taking the successes of the FDA, of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, of the uh, uh, National Institutes of Health, the Indian Health Service, and others, and bringing those in so that we can create a clearinghouse of what works. Here are some examples of what we're doing. Number one, at the Centers for Disease Control, they focus on what they call women in biomedical careers. And how do we reach women, and how do we help them mentor others into the occupation? One, we have changed the conversation. With millennials, if you notice, how many of us are aware and the phone doesn't need to respond of the study now, Workforce 2020. Workforce 2020 uh, is on the heels of Workforce 2000, which came out many years ago that predicted we'd be where we are today. And we didn't really kind of wake up and recognize it. But to Dr. Singer's point about the federal actual strategy for STEM, one of the things the United States ranks in the middle of the world educationally. That's pretty scary when we used to be number one. We as a country used to graduate the world's largest number of engineers. Now we're graduating the world's fewest engineers. And there have been a number of studies to focus on that. When we talk about women in biomedical careers, how do we actually reach out and get the women involved in some of the workplace challenges that existed in the old world? Because the young women coming into the environment now expect diversity, they expect inclusion, they expect to continuously learn, because millennials develop portable careers. What does that mean? That means they're not only thinking about you, but they are also looking at what else can happen. Under this Workforce 2020 recommendation, one finding was that they actually will not stay longer than five years which means that if they are going to have a portable career, how can we make sure as both private and public sector that we're retaining them? Because at a point we have to recognize that if we do not pay attention to STEM, then we are going to lose from a security perspective. Does that make sense? And what I mean by that is that we have to always ensure national security. From the health and human services perspective, our ability to ensure the well-being and the health care of Americans and our citizens, we have to make sure that we develop and retain those who have requisite skills and responsibilities. There have been a number of studies that look at how can we engage minorities and women more. And one of the things we're doing is we found great success, not only with internship programs, but with involving the students in medical research. Wow, that's kind of like on the job training from years ago. And we're seeing great, great success, and I can reference the study at the end. Another is we're recruiting by social media. If we are, if we are posting ads in newspapers, good morning, wrong setting. <laughs> that recruit adventurous, but it will not recruit the next generation of workers virtual job fairs. We're not really sponsoring job fairs where everybody comes and you hope to get a thousand resumes of qualified individuals. They are now doing it virtually where you can apply online, be interviewed online, be offered a job online, and start. Wow, what a difference. This type of setting today and what we're doing now is a sign of the change in the times that we're focused on. Remember when we all showed up and sat? Now we have the majority of those listening 
by Telcon. That's a huge change in our culture from years ago. We are also looking at how do you partner with affinity groups. Affinity groups can be very successful in helping you recruit for the next generation of workers in the STEM occupation specifically. Yes, K through 12 is absolutely where we need to go. So I'm not going to really say the repeat, I'm going to say what else are we doing. We're also showcasing success. How do you take the engineer who has reached out and has trained and developed others and celebrate that success, not only within the organization, but outside of the organization? How do we go to marketplace to find our individuals? If you look at, I found a chart that showed that the majority of STEM qualified individuals are in the East Coast and the West Coast with some in the Southwest region. But if you look at the middle population of the United States, very few. Are we looking to see why? Or do we ask ourselves the question, why is the central part of the United States not particularly representative of the STEM type of student graduates? Hmm, that's <coughs> interesting. So we have to begin to question why, where is it? Why is it that Seattle seems to have? Is it the quality of work life in that area? Is, but then some people say, well, there's the East Coast. Very expensive. So where do we begin to look? We also have uh, one of the things that we're doing is interns and externs. Do you have an affiliation with the college or university so that when they come on board, students, they can receive credit for working in that environment while still in school? That's huge. Fellows program, as Bernadette mentioned. And then one of the other things that I thought to share with you is most people are saying, where else can I find? What else is in the market? I'm doing everything I need. Have you thought about veterans? The reason why I say this, because VA provides significant financial benefits to a certain percentage of veterans who are re-entering the workforce for them to go to colleges and fully pay. And I'm not talking about the Montgomery GI Bill, I'm talking about their vocational rehabilitation and education program where a percentage of veterans are eligible for full replacement, full, including a stipend to them. So are we reaching out to that population of veterans that can be trained? And we're talking veterans that are veterans, chronologically gifted area, <laughs> coupled with those who are coming back from, from uh, Afghanistan and Iran at this point, and Iraq at this point. So those are some of the things we're doing, and I just wanted to share a couple of things with you from the Workforce 2020. Number one, 51% of U.S. workers will be 40 plus years old, while 55 uh, years old will increase by 20%, and they will be in the workplace. People are no longer retiring and rocking on a chair, rocking in a chair on a porch. They are re-entering the workforce. Uh, millennials will continue to enter the workforce and have an estimated, four, they will be 47%. Wow. More women will enter. Latinos will potentially account for 30% of the U.S. population. Older workers are staying in their job, as we said. As we said. There will be increased globalization and virtualization of the labor supply market. Very interesting dynamics. And there will be a shortage of top talent. In fact, the numbers are, by the U.S. Bureau of St Labor Statistics, the U.S. Department of uh, Labor and Education predicts that 60% of new jobs created over the next two decades will require only 20% of the current workforce in the United States. And unless we can bridge the gap of the perceived biases and disparities in education among minorities and women, that that <coughs> becomes a huge supply for our labor force that we're going to face a, a, a top talent or a war in talent crisis. Sorry, thank you. Well, thank you very much. So, so we've got about a half hour to go through some questions. So I'll start with a couple questions and we can go to the room here and then to the phone. Um, so, when you look at the vastness of the federal government and how you're dealing with all these workforce challenges, one of the themes I sort of, I detected as I was listening to the different, the different perspectives on this is this question of how we use information to guide our decision making in this space. I mean, 
And if you look at the federal government, you're talking about literally millions of employees and you know hundreds of programs tracking outreach to students and so forth. So my question to the group, and I'll start with you, Ventress, is can you talk about what you see as some of the data and information challenges in this space? And when I, when I say that, what I mean is, how well do you understand the, the, the current and the future workforce needs of your agencies? How well do, do you understand where, I mean, you, you sort of alluded to this by looking at the geographic distribution of students. How well do you understand those two sides, both the, the student and the, the supply side and the demand side? And where are some of the gaps when you're looking at the data of what you like to know that you don't know and, and things of that, of that nature? Well, I believe that we have to really hone in on what specific STEM occupations we'll need now and into the future. And that starts with a basic human capital principle that there must be a workforce planning element associated with the occupation. What are our current skill sets? What are we looking for toward the future? And what the gap is between the two? And once you identify what your gap is, where do you go to get it? I remember a really good friend of mine who deals with large system integrations. He said trying to find some types of the engineering occupation has become very challenging. So one of the things that he did was to think about, let me create project managers with a particular skill set to supervise varying types of engineers to get them to go. So data is looking at what does uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics tell us? And you know, every two years they publish a study on where we're going as America when it comes to our occupations. And one of the principal occupations that we have <coughs> significant growth is computer science. Now, under computer science, there are 10 different disciplines, but we should be paying attention to that. So we use data in that regard. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the challenges with our agency is recruitment of top notch um, talent. Um, so what we need to do is uh, more succession planning, um, because we also have the impact of the workforce retiring about um, about 30% will we have <coughs> more than 20 years of service, and then about 10% have more than 30 years of service. So within over the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to be seeing lots of our institutional knowledge disappear. Um, one of the things I think would be helpful is also just going into the pipeline, as I mentioned, and going to those institutions and probably just establishing different types of educational programs. For example, there, is, there are, um, we do have the CIRCE, which is the Centers for Excellence in Regulatory Science. And those are partnerships with some universities and there are certain projects and then there's training as well. So also trying to build that infrastructure where you can get the knowledge out there to organizations so you can attract those um, scientists or those engineers or those folks who wouldn't necessarily consider um, regulatory science. At least that's unique for our organization. Yeah, I'm trying to decide which angle to go. I think because there, there's such good conversation with others about working within agencies, I want to acknowledge that NSF is also faced with some challenges with moving our, uh, to Alexandria and a workforce that's close to retirement age, and that we have some novel mechanisms with um, rotators and the Governmental Personnel Act and bringing in people from all over the country. Uh, but I, I think because we're hearing such good things from other colleagues, I want to focus a little bit more on building the STEM talent of the future and then getting our heads wrapped around the data there. So NSF is the source for science and engineering indicators, which comes out every two years and gives a good sense uh, of where the field is, fields are moving. And I think what we're finding is one needs to be very cautious about making predictions about the future in broad brush strokes. And so we're focused much more on building a quality STEM workforce that's adaptive and <coughs> flexible. And then you kind of want to look at what kind of metrics there are about your success. So right now, we know that across all demographic groups, if you look at students that start college wanting to be STEM majors, 60% of them 
leave within the first two years. And if we want to reach the goal of a million new STEM workers by 2020, a stated goal as a result of the President's Council of Advisors in Science and Technologies engaged to excel report, if we could get up to even 50% retention, we would be 75% of the way to a million more STEM workers. And from the research that's out there, one of the best ways to get there would be to just do a better job helping those students learn in the first two years. So for us, um, investing heavily in transforming higher education to improve that experience is critical. Um, and we're thinking of all fields, right? I mean, you have to be careful, right? We, I, I, I'm a PhD biologist working in the government, and uh, we there are many areas where we need um, more life scientists. But if you're thinking about academic positions, only 10% of all PhDs in biology that are graduating now are going to find themselves in a faculty position. So we're going to have to find ways to help them understand other opportunities like the ones all of our agencies have. So we're working very hard. There was a launch um, two days ago at NSF of this uh, national community-wide blog to get people's input on graduate education modernization. We have a lot of programs coming in place where students that are in graduate education will be doing internships in industry, in the private sector. They'll have global research experiences and really trying to rethink all of that. With regard to the data though, we iPads which tracks students, but there's real limitations to that in terms of measuring our success that are aligned only with the traditional model of going to a four-year residential school. Right? So iPads is first time, full time students. And we know that the majority of students that choose a community college pathway with certificates or credentials, maybe not even an associate's degree, move between multiple community colleges that are in and out in a four to five or even six year time frame isn't realistic for most of those students who are not 18 years old and have multiple commitments. So we've got to get better at that. Um, the folks at our um, National Center for Science and Engineering and Statistics are really thinking how we define STEM workforce. Um, right now, it uses the traditional Bureau of Labor Statistics definition, but that doesn't include healthcare workers, and it doesn't include um, your high school science teacher, and yet we know we need 100,000 um, new um, STEM teachers in our public schools in the next 10 years. So I think there's some very significant challenges in the data, and we've got to be careful about the grain size, and I think we've got to focus more on what we know about all the opportunities that are in kind of the middle skills workforce as well as at the PhD level, although many of our agencies rely very, very heavily on a talented PhD workforce, so not to um, negate the importance of that, but to think more broadly and to be more careful about the grain size and to maybe not make broad sweeping statements about the STEM workforce. Very good. Chris? Uh, great. So there's benefits to going last, so I can shamelessly build off of some of my panel members. <laughs> um, so um, I reflect a little bit about what people were saying. So the, I, I, so I made brief lists here about some of the things that I think NSA is good at, and maybe some of the areas where we're less good. So I think we're probably good at um, working with some of our institutions of higher learning, where we're working with them to get them to shape their curriculums to meet our needs better. So I think we're doing well in that regard. Um, I think we're doing, I think we're doing reasonably good in terms of our matching of our candidates to the job openings that we have. Again, we've done a, we've done a couple of newer things. Again, so one of our dilemmas is again we've got a, maybe a wealth of applications to try to winnow through, and then find the right candidates for the right jobs. Again, we've used a couple of new techniques. Uh, that have been uh, reasonably uh, productive in doing and getting better fits in terms of the candidates to the jobs. Um, 
uh, we're reasonably good, of course, at doing training and development. So uh, the colleges aren't graduating a lot of intelligence analysts. You know, they come to us and we've got to do a considerable amount of training, uh, both on uh, their respective targets as well as um, some of the uh, legal minefields in which they need to navigate themselves through. Um, so those are the things I think we're good at, maybe the things where we're less good. Um, so we have, I think we have trouble maybe perhaps gauging what our priorities are as an organization. Um, again, you know, the, our favorite phrase is everything's important, but of course it is. Um, the, I think the other challenges uh, go to the issues of like recruitment uh, of, of diverse talent. So um, I think in the STEM field, again, that specifically goes to the issue about that there's, there's limits in terms of you know, the diversity of talent in some of the protected categories. Uh, you know, we can go after them. Uh, it seems like every company, uh, every government sector agency is faced with this sort of same similar challenge. Again, I hear Google coming up and you know and coming clean with the fact that you know they're not they're not happy with what their diversity balance is, uh, but they recognize that again that the pool of talent that's available represents a challenge in and of itself. Um, so the I think the the issue uh, Bill maybe on a little bit what Susan talked about the uh, issues with regard to the future needs and how do we shape our workforce when things when things world events are changing so fast. So quickly, the skills mix that people need uh, are also changing very quickly. Um, and I think one of the areas that we're observing um, that we're having maybe a, some amount of difficulty is, is that uh, it's the candidates that we're getting and training them in the areas of the soft skills that they need. So they're weak on interpersonal skills. You know, I'd rather text my friend James here than talk to him. I won't be doing that, James. Actually, um, <laughs> <Same> questions. <laughs> right. So, um, so that is so. It's all of those things that again that make people productive in the workforce. It's their interpersonal <coughs> skills. It's their collaboration skills. It's their teaming skills. It's the things that we need them to do uh, that maybe we haven't required them to do maybe quite as much in the past, but we're going to need that in the future. No, it's it's interesting, and having done a lot of panels talking about these workforce needs, it's amazing to me how similar the the complaints and the conversation is amongst the federal agencies as to do is if you talk to some of the Fortune 500 companies. I mean, I'm struck by the fact that that there the, the same kinds of gaps exist because they're dealing with the same pipeline in both cases. Um, so, so now uh, let's 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 go to questions from the room. There's a question over here, and uh, so you'll you'll tell it to me, and then I'll repeat it to the phone. All right. Uh, I'll try to make sure it's a question. So uh, my name's Tom Bond with Monster and. Uh, I am um, struck by the 60% leave rate as a former math major who washed out of, out of uh, being a math major at uh, getting a C in calculus. I knew I was due, and I was delighted that I attained the C, which just helped survival. Uh, is there a way to uh, dumb down some of the STEM courses so that we don't have the washout rate early and then as they become late bloomers in STEM that they stick with it because once they wash out they're out. So is, is anybody pursued that at all? And I'd like to hear about that and then this is my comment. Um, uh, I try to maintain my cool that the government and, and industry is uh, so invested in developing relations with universities as the method of attracting students. Meanwhile, one out of five kids that goes to the career center, four out of five are online doing their work to figure out where they're going to go to work. And, uh, and they're, they're not necessarily doing it through social media, they're doing it through tools that reach where they're going to go to work. So if we could break that paradigm, and uh, GAO did that. They went to all the universities, sent their alumni to them, which were basically party trips, 
and they spoke with people, and they maybe got some people, but the volumes weren't there. So back to the original question, is there a way to dumb down STEM early so you don't lose the people that eventually become good learners, they're just slow learners up front? Um, so let me, let, me, let me rephrase this question. Thank you. I will be very delicate. Um, so right. the, the question was talking about the 60% uh, washout rate, if you will, of people who are going to college and what we can do about that to capture, you know, the, the, the phrase was, can we dumb down the curriculum at the college level so you capture more people who maybe start slow? And I think one of the things, a lot of people when they come to these conversations and are not aware of this, the fact that only 40% graduate, this is really like the, the landscape defined in one statistic because everybody when they talk about STEM, they a lot of times start, and I, I mean, I've even heard the president do this, they start with the need to inspire more kids to study in STEM. But if you look at the data, it's in fact that, that all of the pipeline needs can be fulfilled if you just raise the percentage of those who persist at, at the university. Inspiration is very, very important in communities that aren't well represented in the STEM fields. And there, there are all sorts of first time, you know, first time activities that happen, but the bulk of the pipeline issue is dealt with with this question of persistence. And, and so, Susan, I'll, I'll, I'll give this to you first, but in the context that I think there's a predominant culture issue within universities when they look at, for engineering is one of the common disciplines, where for 100 years the dynamic was we're going to screen down to only those who are good enough to become professional engineers, and that's the dynamic. So if you're not good enough, you know, too bad, move on to something else. Can you talk about how, how you're approaching this particular challenge and the cultural issue as well? I, I would, and actually I did sit in intro engineering, and you know, they said, look to your left, look to your right, one of you will be here in four years. And um, it, and it was a whole crowd of talented folks. So uh, I think we have to, think about talent building versus talent selection. And the, I, I just want to briefly speak to the math problem because it is so critical and it is so important, not just for STEM fields, but for the social sciences. Right now, when our students enter college, 60 or 70% of those students are not ready for college level math. Now, we know that of those students that take developmental math, so this will make you feel really good about your seat, right? You're just gonna be like way up there with this Five percent succeed. And if we look at all students that come into college and enroll in a developmental course, 80% of those students are going to leave without credit for a single college course in four years. So we could say these students aren't ready, or we could say we are not ready for those students. And I think what we have to do is say we need to be ready, and it's not always dumbing down the course, but it's thinking about how you start where the learner is, and you help them succeed. That's actually why we pay faculty to show up in classrooms, is they're supposed to teach, not you know pick winners and losers. And we know, I, and I'll give you a great example, because I, 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 these are all really depressing numbers to think about. So what are we doing? Where are their successes? So there's been some very interesting work going on in developmental math. Tony Brake at the Carnegie Foundation, and we have a fairly significant investment in this has developed a program with Barry Treisman called Statway and Quantway. And he said, you know, you come to, say, community college, and you've not been able to pass algebra, right? You've taken algebra four or five times, and you get maybe two <coughs> shots at community college, and then they tell you to go away, right? Go home, don't, you know, you're done with college. I said, you're approaching it the wrong way. What are the math skills that you actually need to be successful in either a STEM or a non-STEM? career, what do you need in order to be successful in getting through community college? So they completely rethought Statway and Quatway and they said, what are the 20% of the things that we need to do of all the possible things we could do that are going to get you 80% of the way to success? So Statway and Quatway now has three times the success with students in math in half the time. So they're really moving. So there are a lot of exciting investments 
that are out there, it's going to continue to take more work, but it's really applying what we know about how people learn, not about how we select people, like creating better learning environments and um, having holistic combination of curricular and co-curricular supports to enable students to be successful. And we're seeing it happen in a large number of our classrooms. Does anybody else want to jump in, Bert? Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Um, I don't have the stats, but I was a former science teacher, and I'm, my background is biology, and I did work in the lab, and then I do have um, education for a graduate level. But um, one of the things I noticed is I, I taught, I don't want to say the term lower level, but really the kids who were either forgotten about or, oh, I know nothing will ever happen to them, the just forsaken kids. And those were the kids that I actually um, mentored and taught them real life applications. So I think it's beneficial not to begin at the college or university level, but to start at the school level, especially um, if not middle school, the high school level. And I've actually run into um, some of those kids later on who I never thought would be going into sports medicine. Or I was just amazed at some of the paths that they had taken. But they told me, it's because of you. And I looked at them like, are you serious? Because I didn't remember teaching them and I wanted to pull my hair out <laughs> because I didn't think they were getting the topic. So I think if you have that influence earlier and make it relevant and make it at least engaging and exciting for them, you just never know what may happen in the future. So to answer your question, I did dumb down the topic for them, but, um, it, and it does work. So I guess, you know, I think it is possible. So uh, now we want to open up to some questions from the phone lines. So please introduce yourself and uh, frame your question. All right, I'll hold for a couple more minutes because I know there's always the, uh, the off-mute uh, off pause. Does anybody on the phone lines have a question? All right, so we'll take another question from the audience here. Please go ahead. Um, thank you for what you're doing, it's fascinating. Um, I have worked in about 29 years in the information technology industry supporting federal government clients, so I've been around you all for a long time here in Washington. My question is, um, and I, my father worked in, in the Marines, I have a brother and sister-in-law in the VA, and I've seen just so many talented people in public service and government. The U.S. government is the, the world's number one employer. They are the largest by far. So there is a lot of human capital talent in the U.S. government. But are there avenues and mechanisms? I just think about all the talented people that I've worked with, really experienced. They don't feel like they work for the U.S. government. They feel like they work for such and such an agency. There's never a holistic view of using all the talent and the human capital that you have. Some of you have done it by where you've gone and what you've done and moved around. But I just wonder if you see opportunity, even as you're it, it, millennials, generation Xers, everybody, and as these new incoming people look for portable careers, I just think that's such an attractive thing. And I went to work for a large multinational conglomerate I left an engineering career, by the way, to do sales and marketing management and went to business school because I couldn't meet my financial objectives as a mechanical engineering major. So I think there are multiple, you know, it's a multi-dimensional thing, but my biggest question in working with the federal government at this point is, is there a way to capitalize upon your size and scale as an attractor to people who want to come to work for governments and public service? <coughs> so it's an interesting question because so the question for those of you on the phone lines was considering you know the fact that the federal government is the world's largest employer how do we sort of aggregate some of the talent and amplify that um, and what are we doing on that front and Chris this sounds like a question I want to direct to you. Uh, great so I'm not ready but um, so, <laughs> um, no so I am ready so I, I guess I would uh, I guess I'd address it maybe on two levels so um, so I think you're right. Uh, again, so I'm relative, uh, maybe among the people here at the panel. Again, I'm relatively new, ten years into my federal career, but you know, prior twenty years in the private sector. So 
Uh, and my observation again is that, um, right, so we're reasonably good at kind of uh, developing a brand identity at the National Security Agency. Um, and, and we're reasonably good even in fact at marketing our agency. We're, we're, we can do better on that, but there is not maybe probably that uh, more holistic uh, federal mindset that you know we're all in this together um, so I don't know the answer to that one unfortunately I think there's probably a, there's a branding you know marketing issue that probably needs to be uh, taken on there but um, to answer a little bit about the whole millennial piece of it so one of the things that we believe is probably the you know the model of the future is um, again I'll let the, the rest of the panel kind of maybe address this too is that uh, you know, going forward, you know, federal careers are not going to be a life sentence. They will be more kind of what we're starting to talk about is more the flow model. You know, it'll be people flowing in at their early stages of their career or guys like me that flowed in on the mid-career level. Uh, but you flow in and out of federal government, you know, at the times uh, that meet your particular needs. So the challenges on that, at least for NSA, are um, yeah, uh, you know, it's it's a it, it, we consider it a tragedy when we lose a single person at the agency. Um, I'm not sure it's a tragedy every single time, um, but that's what I hear. So um, no laughter. Um, so then our dilemma is, well, what do we do about that? So we you know we uh, so we bring our students in, we hang on to them, we hook them for a couple of years, they leave, uh, they go out, they go to work for name your favorite consulting firm probably for a fairly larger amount of money. Right. And, but then later when their, you know, their needs are changed or their focus is a little bit different, how do we bring them back into government? Their salary is X, we can't meet that. So, so we've talked, we've already been brainstorming a little teeny bit about, well, what is, are there things that we could do that would appeal to the people on a more individual, motivational level? Uh, you know, could we offer something with regard to a Again, I'm making things up, uh, you know, some sort of a pension accrual, you know, because now James is coming back in, he's 40 years old, sorry, uh, maybe. Uh, I'm being kind. Um, <laughs> um, so, but those are the. But I have to admit, I'm wondering how you knew that exactly. <laughs> uh, but those are some of the things that we thought about is that we you know, are there things that we could do that would say, uh, you know, James, you come back in, you know, you're a former employee, you came back to us within 10 years, we give you some sort of a maybe additional pension accrual, which benefits you, that attracts you, but also makes it a little bit more palatable that you got to take, I'm going to make it up, a 10, 20 percent cut in salary. So, so sorry, I go add, ahead, please. So, so there's a number of initiatives underway. Uh, the number one initiative is what the Office of Personnel Management at the Chico Council level have introduced which we've all signed on, and HHS is one of the pilots, and it's called GovConnect. And GovConnect allows uh, the sharing of resources on similar, similar type projects or initiatives across federal agencies. And, and that's, that's pretty, it's kind of like uh, cloud employment. Mm -hmm. So, and I think they actually have a, a, an acronym or a term that, that uses that without confusing of the actual cloud itself. And that's number one. The second item is that the president's, uh, president of the United States has introduced a program called uh, uh, Presidential Innovators. I'm sure some of you might, you can look on the whitehouse.gov. And these are, they have selected uh, individuals from around the United States private sector and bring them into government to work collaboratively across government on significant type issues where we can solve globally. The third is uh, we have found an increase in the use of uh, intra and interagency details, where I lend you to another agency on a project. And that, that actually is taking off more than in the past. Uh, the next is there's been an increased use of IPAs. And, and to your point, uh, Chris, the, the government's workforce will change to more of a multi-sector workforce. And one of the things that we tried to introduce most recently in HHS through the Chico Council was what we call an executive exchange program. That while we have IPAs where we can go to a nonprofit or an academic institution and get talent and reimburse that institution, 
we wanted to be able to, for example, suppose I want to go to a pharmaceutical company and bring an executive in and swap so that they can learn leadership or different skill sets. There are federal laws that prohibit that sort of thing. How do we change it? I think now is a time, unlike before, that that is on the horizon. And then the last two items, the phased retirement. Have any of you heard of this? This is where Congress passed a bill to allow for a full-time federal employee to be phased into retirement so that they only work half-time. And then the other uh, 40 or the other 40 hours or, or half-time is not only dedicated to the work, but to mentoring, developing, and training others. So that's huge. And then the last, which I, I just am absolutely delighted about, is the Senior Executive Candidate Development Program. And more and more agencies are selecting those from other agencies that in the past, and veterans can tell you after 39 years, was unheard of. Uh, SC, uh, we just finished ours in uh, HHS, and we selected for the 20 slots six people from different federal agencies to bring that talent in. So we are beginning to share. We're going to export the talent for mentoring in other agencies. So those are examples of what's on the horizon. You know, it all begins one step at a time. Can I just add a little? Sure. And maybe NSF is a little bit different beast, but we see a lot of these things going on. So I, I, I'm an executive IPA at NSF. Okay. Well, this was just my second tour of duty at NSF. I was in the bio directorate um, about 15 years ago. Um, but I watched like, so my, sadly, one of my cherished employees yesterday just took a job with FDA, but we're really excited <laughs> that this is happening. And we just hired somebody from the Census Bureau. And we ha I have another colleague who was at USDA and NIH and then came to us. We have a number of our staff that are uh, APAs that are working um, at OSTP. We had one that was on long-term professional development last year was up at Harvard, another one that's working with public television. Um, and we also we have a science assistant program where you come and you can only stay for two years. But this is for students that are, you know, most of them have master's degrees, but they're, they're young, they're getting going. And then they move and they end up getting positions in other parts of the government. Um, some agencies like USAID, they're able to hire their AAAS fellows, many of them stay. We don't have a position at that kind of middle tier at NSF. So our AAAS fellows <coughs> come knowing at most they can stay two years. And they go on and they do all sorts of interesting things. Our last one is doing great things in uh, DOD in the Office of Naval Research. And then the other layer that I'm seeing is this federal STEM strategic plan. The, the agencies working together, and there are so many people that are engaged in this, learning about each other's places. So I, I, I would join you in saying I'm optimistic. It's not perfect. We've right, got a right. lot of work to do. Right. But I, I see people embracing right. the whole government. Yeah, that, that um, what do you call it? Functional silos? It's right. slowly. <laughs> I just think that whole area of integrated talent management, I mean, top talent wants yeah. to work for an enterprise that values talent. Exactly. And feels right. We all want to work for uh, leaders, and and so I just think, and I I appreciate the 2020 workforce quoting because I think a lot of the millennials generally like, they want to make a difference in the world, and public service and civil service is a unbelievable opportunity to do that. So I see a perfect storm potential. You know. Well, I think that's actually a good ending point for this conversation. So I'll thank, thank all of our panelists and thank everybody who could join on the phone lines as well. Thank you.